Okay, everybody, welcome to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network, right on YouTube. If you haven't done so already in the past, we ask you to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below and hit that notification bell anytime we release new material here on Ring Respect. You'll be the first to know it. You can also catch Ring Respect Radio now through Backbreaker Media's channels, both on Podbean and YouTube. So if you haven't checked us out here, you can always check us out there and uh, make sure to go and like and subscribe over on both Podbean and YouTube where you can check out all the greatest in wrestling podcasts here in Western Canada. Today on the show, though, we are going to be talking about tag team wrestling. And speaking of tag teams, I'm here as always with my video bro, the man with the angelic voice. He is Papa Smokes. How are you, Papa Smokes? I'm doing great, Munson. Hey, yo, to all the wrestling people out there. So, Pop Smokes, tag team wrestling, that's going to be the subject of today's topic. And the reason being, unfortunately, just recently at the end of September, the world uh, was robbed of another great legend in the wrestling business, uh, Road Warrior Animal, uh, untimely passing. Yeah, what a, what a terrible shock and uh, bad news for the entire wrestling world. And uh, only 60 years old, too, a, a surprise. We had seen uh, clips and pictures of uh, Joe Laurinaitis back uh, from the previous months and previous years i always thought he looked good and uh he looked healthy and uh yeah just a shock to find him uh, dead at age 60. the uh subject of today's thing we're going to get into talking about tag team wrestling the history of some tag teams in the industry some of the greatest of all time but uh you can't talk about the greatest without talking about the road warriors though can you pop smokes yeah that's absolutely right they were one of the tag teams that made an indelible mark on the wrestling business and uh Laurinaitis and Hegstrand or Animal and Hawk were just uh, unforgettable uh, characters and unforgettable wrestlers. And uh, we'll we'll never probably see another tag team like them in professional wrestling. Probably not. And you'll probably be able to help me out a little bit more with the uh, the history on this one. But if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, Paul Ellering that came up the original idea for the Road Warriors gimmick itself. He was looking to create a stable of sorts in Georgia Championship Wrestling called the Legion of Doom, which have inevitably gave their name in the WWF, WWE later on. But uh, he came up with the ideas of Hawk and Animal being these road warriors, these uh, bikers that came out. And that's where the face paint started kicking in and everything like that. And the gimmick kind of unfolded with uh, manager Paul Ellering at the time. Yeah, yeah. those. The, I think it started as Animal as a singles wrestler at first. And uh I don't know if you've seen some of those uh, original matches where they debuted him in Georgia Championship Wrestling. We've talked about and watched that great wrestling show from the 80s, which basically became WCW afterwards. But uh, those uh, early matches where they, they didn't quite have the presentation uh, figured out yet. And uh, Animals got wearing the uh, the uh, Daisy Duke denim shorts with the, with the little boots on and the, uh, and the denim vest and everything. Uh, yeah, clearly the look needed a little bit of work, but once they got uh, Hawk on board and uh, decided on the kind of uh, look from from the movie The Road Warrior, uh, with the face paint and everything, uh, it, it was it was a gimmick that got a lot of attention and it got everybody's attention at that time. So very uh, well uh, well rounded out team. They uh, managed to really kind of conquer the world of professional wrestling, and we're not talking just about the North American market. Uh, These guys traveled everywhere in the world. Uh, Four-time NWA National Tag Team Champions. Uh, They were the AWA World Tag Team Champions on top of a couple runs at the WWF as the Tag Team Champions over there. And I believe if I was reading correctly, some of the Tag Team Championships they held within the NWA are the ones that inevitably became known as the WCW Tag Team Champions. So even though on record they never were WCW Tag Team Champions, They did hold the belts that were eventually known as those titles. Yeah, and and by the same token, uh, I think one of the only other Triple Crown champions uh, like that were uh, uh, Team 3D or the Dudley Boys. I guess they they have uh, tag team titles, and AWA wouldn't have been around by that time, but uh, all the major federations as well. There might be one or two other uh, Triple Crown champs, but it hasn't happened very often, and... uh, the Warriors were the first and uh, most explosive to do it. Yeah, I think it's uh, times have changed a little bit now. I think they make a bigger deal out of teams, though, and they tend to win the ones in New Japan as well as the North American Championships and everything. But you're right about the Triple Crown. 
it was almost an impossible feat for teams back in the day to ever get there. But if any team was ever going to do it, the Road Warriors were by far the one team that needed to and should be doing that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. And and uh, we were talking about their presentation. I mean, they're one of those teams that was the the booking was was simple for them because their work had already been done before any match would start. Just in the way they looked, their uh, gigantic and huge, powerful bodies. That you know, there were a few strong men in wrestling before that, but when these two came up, they really, really changed the game for that. And then you saw a lot more uh, muscle guys after that. But also, yeah, just in their appearance, their general uh, presentation, the they would be booked as uh, s- squashers, so to speak. They would come in rush the ring, beat the opponents, and and always a short match with their opponents getting little or no offense in. So, I mean, that that sort of gimmick worked perfectly for the booking in all those companies. And uh, uh, this was another thing, too, that, that with booking like that, they, they didn't get the experience that a lot of wrestlers have of bumping and, and, and taking uh, taking uh, offensive moves from their opponents because a lot of their matches were squash matches. So they, Hawk and Animal had to learn slowly as they went along because uh, they, they never were getting beat. They were never getting uh, uh, beaten up in their matches or on the defensive kind of thing. So they, they, they were a work in progress. They, they certainly weren't the best workers of any tag team in terms of uh, technical wrestling or anything like that, but uh, they had that locomotive freight train kind of booking that just put them right to the top in any company they were in, and quite frankly, the fans just couldn't get enough of it. And rightfully so. Uh, it almost makes me uh, believe that then uh, later on when Paul Ellering, uh, more recently, I guess, in NXT, took over the team of the Authors of Pain. It really kind of, for me, had that old-school feel of the original Road Warriors to it. They weren't necessarily the fastest or, you know, best workers inside the ring, but that feel of the two big powerhouses coming in and Paul Ellering being able to sell them as two big powerhouses, I think really inevitably made them a team to watch at the time. And the second they took that Paul Ellering element out from the AOP, was the downfall of them as a tag team. Lucky enough, back in the day of the Road Warriors, that wasn't the case. You didn't pull managers from guys immediately after putting them together. You allowed that to gel and mold and get to work with each other for many years to understand each other and get to work on a better uh, level together. Yeah, and I think the AOP also were were kind of uh, challenged in in the area of promos. So then it's a good idea for them to have a, a manager by their side especially a, a brain like uh, Paul Ellering, always a good promo, and always an intelligent guy. And uh, But uh, I, I like the way he worked with Hawk and Animal too because <clears throat> he uh, could carry some of the uh, promo for them, but they were also pretty good in their rough way too. They uh, All of their uh, promos as a team would feature all three of them speaking. And, and as we know, Hawk has some... Uh, very memorable lines, including uh, "What a rush" and a few other things, uh, and uh, those the, they had the ability to uh, speak to the fans too, and that got them over as well. I uh, wanted to tell a little bit of a story because we like going back on our own personal lives and stuff like that, and everything of memories. And I remember as a little kid, uh, you know, I've, I've told you many times before, being a WWF fan as a child. I remember seeing the Legion of Doom back in the time when they were running there, when they were tag team champions over there. And I, I really recall this going to Lawson Heights Mall in Saskatoon as a kid. And they had this store, which I believe is now an insurance company or something in that location. But at the end of the day, they had this store that sold video games and everything. And I remember seeing this box for this Nintendo game. And it was a, a wrestling game that I had never witnessed before. Because the ones I was personally familiar with were the ones that were labeled with the WWF stuff. Was not familiar with anything outside their own company at the time. And I remember seeing this picture on the front cover... And I'm like, I swear that's Hawk and Animal of the Legion of Doom. But everything I kept reading on this kept saying about the Road Warriors. And I was so unfamiliar with them outside of that WWF aspect that I did not understand that these were the same guys just under the name that they did outside of what I was used to growing up. And reading into this whole thing kind of brought up that memory for me of seeing that game that one day. And that was, I think, the first time that I started to realize as a really young kid, I'm talking about six, seven years old, 
that there was wrestling outside of the wrestling I was exposed to. Yeah, yeah, that must have been an eye opener. Hey, Munson, uh, I have a similar story like that too. I remember uh, I'm a bit older than you, Munson, so I was playing some of my video games in the stand up arcades, you know, popping quarters in and such. And uh, I remember there was a game called um, Wrestling Slam or, or something to that effect, and it was a Japanese game, very early 80s. Uh, uh, awkward kind of a video game but it was the only wrestling game that they had and i wanted to play that and they had takeoffs on some of the uh, north american stars that had uh, interesting uh, uh characters and such uh, the, the player the player one that you controlled was called uh kid dynamite and yeah. was clearly based on uh, uh, dynamite kid uh, as a face in Japan, and then one of the uh, one of your opponents was a uh, Power Warrior, and it was clearly uh, Animal from the Road Warriors. And I remember thinking, "Wow, like these guys are getting really big because now they're in a video game. They obviously don't have the rights to the real name." But uh, uh, I remember uh, the, noting that too, the, to think that wow, they're getting in the big Japanese video games now too. Well, speaking of the 1980s and Japanese wrestling scene, as you brought that up. Actually, uh, Animal, who we speak of, spent about five years over in Japan after uh, getting out of the North American market from about 1985 to 1990, uh, making a name over there in both All Japan Pro Wrestling and some appearances in New Japan Re Pro Wrestling during that five-year span. Yeah, yeah. Are, are you talking about Hawk? I think it might have been Hawk because once the uh, LOD broke up in WWE, he went over and formed... Uh, a similar tag team to the Road Warriors with that uh, uh, Kensuke Sasaki, I think, who is a quite a huge muscular dude over there, and he got the makeup on it. They each took different partners for a little while after the team uh, was dissolving, and uh, never, of course, with even a fraction of the same uh, success and respect as the Road Warriors had, but. Uh, uh, with their various pairings. We saw what the WWE did with them too, putting the uh, ventriloquist dummy as, as, as one of their sidekicks and having uh, uh, Tammy Sitch or Sonny uh, uh, managing them and such. It, it just, they never really got <clears throat> over in the WWE. And I think it was partly because of what we were talking about before with that booking that, that pushed them hard like a, like a freight train kind of thing. Vince didn't want to give them that in WWE, so they were uh, they they didn't go on a winning streak or anything like that, and uh, I don't think they looked in invulnerable to the fans, and they, they just were booked differently, and it 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 wasn't booked to their strengths. I think it was booked to their weaknesses, and I mean they had their popularity there, but they weren't uh, they they never made nearly the splash in WWE that they did in the rest of the the country and the world for that matter. Yeah. And I believe when you were mentioning uh, Hawk going over there, their run in WWE actually lasted from 1990 to 1992 before that split when Hawk left uh, okay. originally and Animal stayed with the WWE as a competitor. Uh, from 85 to 90 was when they spent the time in All Japan and New Japan prior to being signed by okay. Vince McMahon and the WWE. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just an interesting fact there that the uh, time was spent. And then you mentioned about taking on different partners. And I had to bring this up because I... I remember when it happened, it was stupid as hell, but Animal and Heidenreich <clears throat> as yeah, the WWE yeah. Tag Team Champions. I mean, I, I like Animal. I mean, I didn't dislike Heidenreich as much as everybody else. I mean, he was kind of garbage in the ring, but I mean, he was he was all right for the most part. Yeah. Plus, I, I liked his fucking poetry, personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that speaks to their history as a team. I mean, you could always kind of tell that Animal was the anchor that, that kind of held the team together, and, and Hawk was the kind of loose cannon. We know that uh, Animal was a more straight edge in his in his uh, private life, and, and Hawk uh, simply a, a wild man for partying and, and drugs and alcohol and all kinds of crazy behavior. And I think a Animal was the guy that he kept the band together for a long time there, and... and uh, I mean, Hawk was spitting in McMahon's face, and I think he slapped McMahon's face and quit a couple of times and took off without notice, and they had to cancel their bookings. And uh, Hawk was a loose cannon. I, I love him, but uh, he, he didn't care sometimes about what happened. And Animal was the guy trying to keep it together, and, and if he had to have 
uh, Heidenreich or Draws or whoever as his partner. And then he came back, his last run in WWE was just, it was like back to the beginning. He was just the road warrior as a single again. It's kind of weird the way uh, things come around again. But uh, yeah, he, he always had his personal life and the business life together quite a lot more than Hawk did. And, and he, uh, he, he helped uh, uh, keep that team going for a long time. I think sometimes hoping for a reunion so they could keep it going. And they did have a few too, but uh, the Hawk was just uh, going to do his own thing no matter what. And then you talk about the Road Warriors inducted into pretty much every Hall of Fame you can think of in professional wrestling. I mean, obviously the WWE Hall of Fame, but they've also been inducted into every other <clears throat> major wrestling Hall of Fame that you can yep. think of, including, I found this one quite interesting, the Quebec Wrestling Hall of Fame right here in Canada. Wow. The Road Warriors also inducted into that uh, back in the uh, late 2000s there as well, too. So a lot of accolades, not just with championships, but uh, where they've been inducted into as Hall of Famers as well, too. And again, we can't stress enough how these guys were two of the absolute best inside that ring. And like you've said, Animal might have been the one that held it together. But something just clicked with them as a tag team. There were two guys that I don't know if individually on their own they were ever two guys we were going to get behind in an accelerated top-of-the-card type team or anything. Or, sorry, top-of-the-card individual wrestlers or anything like that. But as a team, there was just something magic that worked between those two guys that... It was sold. It was sold well. It didn't matter where they went. You just you were glued to them. I remember watching as a kid, watching those Legion do matches, and even though they weren't booked the same as they were everywhere else, I still was wildly behind that whole gimmick. I liked them. I liked that they were two big, brutish-type guys, and I felt like when they got inside the ring, that it didn't matter if they were going up against you know other big guys. I felt like they were going to hold their own in there. I didn't feel like these guys were going to go in there and get crushed by the natural disasters or somebody like that along the path. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll share a childhood memory of Road Warriors too. I have talked on this podcast before about being a teenager in Winnipeg and, and being taken to the matches by my dad and brother and going with friends sometimes to the... Uh, Vern Gagne's AWA, and when the Road Warriors made their run in AWA, it was it was electrifying for the young wrestling fan. I, I was I was going crazy, but anyway, they had a they had a long angle that was going on between uh, uh, Sheik Adnan El Casey, and this was was the, their Sheik character. He had a little uh, army or faction going, which included uh, Bruiser Brody, and they had kicked. Jerry Blackwell or Crusher Blackwell out of their out of their uh, a faction, and then there was going to be a big blow off match of Bruiser Brody versus Jerry Blackwell in the cage. They took this match on tour for sure, but one of the places they that it was going to be was Winnipeg, and my brother and I were excited for this match for so long. It was going to be why we loved Brody. We knew he was a huge star uh, throughout the world. And when we got to the show, the main event got changed because Brody no-showed, which we all know that he was uh, notorious for doing, holding up promoters sometimes, saying, well, you got to pay me double that now or I'm not going to appear on your show tonight and, and you're going to lose money in the long run. He did stuff like that, and uh, and we know what, what happened at the end there. But uh, at any rate, uh, we were disappointed that... Uh, uh, Brody wasn't going to be there, so the Sheik came out and purchased the services of from Paul Ellering of of a road warrior. He, he chose Hawk, and Hawk wrestled uh, Blackwell in this blow-off cage match, which, like I say, we were all looking forward to, was, was the culmination of an almost year-long feud. And when Brody no-showed, it was disappointing. But I remember thinking, wow, Hawk got in there like, he probably wasn't intending to do that match when he showed up here today and, and did a real good job of it. Lots of blood, lots of uh, crazy. He was in one of those old wire link uh, cages, one of the uh, schoolyard fence kind of cages where you're uh, so violent and raking each other's uh, foreheads across that and lots of juice. And wow, I, I still remember that as such a great match. It would have been fun to be able to see live and, Unfortunately, you know, fans of nowadays are not going to get the opportunity to experience either one because we have lost both Hawk and Animal over the years. Unfortunately, the 
Road Warriors, the Legion of Doom, however you remember them, uh, no longer with us, and that's unfortunate. But it's a good thing that we've got old tapes, old YouTube videos and stuff like that, that, everything at our disposal to go back and watch a lot of these guys. And you know what? In my opinion, a lot of young young people in the business or young people getting into the business should look at you know any of these old guys and look at some of the stuff they did. And we're not saying you have to go back and do exactly what they did, but... I, we were talking before the show went live on the air here today, Pop Smokes, and I was mentioning that you could learn a lot. I've gone back and watched a lot of this old stuff that I hadn't seen from the past, and there's things that I take from it and go, man, if you took this and put a new fresh spin on it with the modern twist, you could really make something of it. And, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth of other teams, like, and I, I'm going to mention them right now. FTR will get mentioned later in the show. And there's a team that, you know, has gone and done stuff like that. They've looked back on old tapes. They've gone and reinvented that old style in a new way that it's got people's attention in the modern eras. So there is opportunity for young people getting into this business to go back, watch a lot of this old wrestling from the Road Warriors or any of these other guys that we're mentioning here on Ring Respect all the time, and really take from what they set in the path here for you. There's a lot to learn, and you can do it by just checking out a lot of this stuff right here on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, it's all there too, and uh, and. You don't have to take it just as it is, but everything can be given a particular spin. It, it, everything can be modernized, and there's a lot of good good ideas out there. But and just the way time goes, a lot of people are stuck in the period of 2000 to 2020 kind of thing of the more modern era, and, and that stuff is all very derivative of uh, of uh, just more modern wrestling matches. And I, I think a lot of the great artistry of it is, is lost to the past. And I find it kind of puzzling sometimes because like I say, it's all out there, but it, it does take work to, to watch, uh, you know, where do you start? Uh, uh, Cause there's, I mean, millions and zillions of hours of uh, old wrestling out there to be watched. But uh, in terms of tag teams, I mean, you, as the as we've seen from Cash and Dax in FTR, they they are uh, very interested in uh, the, the basically the the golden time of uh, of of tag team professional wrestling, which would be the the eighties in Jim Crockett Promotions. We, you remember the tag team tournament, the Crockett Cup, was uh, brought all of the best tag teams to the board. They, they would have 25, 26 tag teams in a huge uh, in a huge tournament, and uh, I, I mean, it, it didn't get any better than that. Uh, I still say that a lot of the best innovations were made in the in the southern U.S. Uh, in terms of tag team uh, psychology and all that, and uh, to to have participated as the Road Warriors and uh, and a few other teams that we still know now is uh, to have participated in the Crockett Cup. You, you've really risen to the top of your profession, and that's why that's why. Um, FTR watch all that stuff is because they're they're a throwback team, and to me it's no uh, it's no surprise that their popularity and success today. Definitely. So we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about them and a lot of other tag teams throughout the years, going dating back to some of the early teams that uh, we both grew up on, and also talking about some of the modern ones, which we'll take a little bit of a look into. Uh, what works about the modern guys and what uh, could be done a little bit better, possibly as well too. Kind of take a look at a little bit of the history of professional wrestling. Uh, before we even get into some of the teams, though, Papa Smokes, I, you know, watching a lot of the modern day wrestling and stuff like that makes me wonder if fans nowadays even understand what the full rules of tag team wrestling even were. Uh, you see a lot of now that, you know, they've changed the rule with the, the tag itself. Like, to me, it always was growing up, that tag had to be two guys walking up to each other, you're clapping the hand to make a proper tag inside that ring. And now it seems like nobody has to hold a tag rope. They can be just about anywhere on that apron, and you can clap any part of the body, even if it's a blind tag. Like you see guys clapping each other across the back. And to me, that's not an official tag, because that's not what I grew up on personally. Yeah, yeah, and I think they added some of those uh, tags like that just to uh, to provide a little bit of suspense in the match. Or they, they wanted tags to happen where the legal man in the ring doesn't realize he's been tagged and sometimes that causes a uh, tension between the tag team partners but i got to agree with you there I, I think that requiring proper tagging and and uh adhering to the rest of tag team rules 
only adds more to the psychology of the match because it, it makes the tag more difficult and then more meaningful when it when it's made. Especially on the hot tags. And I got, yeah. I got to bring that up because I remember watching as a kid and you, you'd always have the baby face. One member of the team's getting the absolute shit kicked out of them by the heel teams. They keep doing, you know, uh, you know, again, they're not doing by the rules. I'd see heel guys all the time and they'd do a high five to themselves in the air while the baby face partner on the apron is all distracted and they're obviously not tagging but they're just doing these gr- things behind the referee's back and getting away with it to the point where finally you'd get that what you think is the hot tag of the match but the referee's eyes were turned away didn't see it the guy would be pushed back out the heels would take over again and you're just absolutely loathing the heels at this point now you've really started to hate them because they couldn't do any more damage to your favorite guy inside that ring and then that one little glimmer of hope comes forth. He kicks out of whatever move it is and springs forward towards his partner and claps that hand. And it really would make you pop in a tag team match when that hot tag happened like that. Yeah, and that's the whole idea of building heat in a tag team match. It it, it works good that way. And that, that the psychology is that the baby face doesn't have to uh, doesn't have to power up and prevail all he has to do is be able to reach his buddy and that's also a theme that that uh, rings true with fans uh, about that you have your friend is ready to back you up and all you got to do is tag his hand and he'll come in there and help you it it builds baby faces it builds heat for the heels and uh yeah the 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 master of the the hot uh the hot tag of course was was ricky morton from the rock and roll express so the those guys had it down to a science and, and he was a pretty boy and a good looking young guy and all that stuff. And the, the fans would be just wailing and crying and, and, and just wringing their hands while, while the heat was built on him. But you knew that, that he was going to get that hot tag at some point and, and Robert Gibson would come in and clean house and they, they had it down to such a, a perfect psychology in a match that the fans couldn't help but go insane. Well, it's a good thing you brought up the Rock and Roll Express because they were one team I wanted to mention here today. And then obviously their epic feuds that they had with the notorious Midnight Express throughout yeah. the years and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, what a great tag team they were as well, too. Um, obviously managed by the, I mean, should we say often controversial individual himself, uh, James yeah. E. Cornette, Jim Cornette, that most modern day fans uh, absolutely cannot stand to listen to, but... Papa Smokes and I, we don't care. We enjoy Jim Cornette and we enjoy the work he's done in the past. So whatever he chooses to say, fuck it. If you don't like it, don't listen. Yeah, yeah. And and however you feel about uh, Cornette on a personal level, he's he's regarded throughout the business as a tag team wrestling genius. He took it to a science. He took it to an art and uh, completely perfected it. And of course, when you're talking about the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express, they... They worked together on this, and they had all the right parts to have the most classic matches. Man, those guys were drawing so much money. Those guys were getting paid 20000 bucks a month for having uh, their feuds and their matches together and such. This is back in the uh, 80s, too. So uh, you know that they were drawing a whole ton of money in the business all throughout the South, wherever they went. And that'll always be one of the most uh, classic tag team wrestling feuds of all time. But I remember even listening to uh, the Jim Cornette uh, podcast recently and him talking about the contracts or the written, final written contracts that they ended up receiving after turning down an opportunity with the WWF. He had promised all sorts of money that they could make with WWF. And then they were given guaranteed contracts, I believe it was in the vein of just shy of $200,000 per year or something. And we're talking about the 1980s at this point in time or even the late seventies when this happened. So, I mean, this was, you know, equating to a lot of money at the time and then even pushed further down the line to try to ask for a quarter of a million, 250,000 on their contract. So that just is the tip of the iceberg of what kind of drawing power that the teams like the midnight express had back in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to remember too, in the history of wrestling, like I, I would say, before the 80s but in the 50s and 60s and 70s pro wrestlers were were some of the best paid uh quote unquote athletes of the uh of the entire uh, sports world and uh in the in the 50s and 60s uh, uh 
some of the top wrestlers like uh, Buddy Rogers and Gorgeous George and uh, Lou Thez were, were making absolutely huge money, uh, uh, as much or more as some of the top guys in baseball, basketball, football. Now, with uh, uh, wrestling, you might be working a little bit more than the than the those pro athletes in sports, like I just mentioned. But um, uh, it's not like that anymore. Obviously, the uh, salaries from sports have skyrocketed into the realms of the absurd by this time. But uh, uh, wrestling, pro wrestling, pay has gone way way down too since uh, since the '90s and the, into the 2000s as well. So. Uh, Interesting that they don't make as much money as they used to now. Uh, uh, the crowds aren't drawing as much these days, but uh, uh, yeah, used to be on par with pro sports. So I want to uh, talk quickly about another team, and uh, reason being because this ties back to a previous episode of Ring Respect Radio, uh, talking about Terry and Dory Funk uh, on the show here today. Yeah. And the reason I brought them up, Papa Smokes, I mentioned to you earlier, is about the battles they had with the Briscoe brothers. We mentioned about the Briscoe brothers and Jerry Briscoe on a recent edition of Ring Respect. I'm going to put a tag up in the video here so you can go back and check out a little bit more on the Briscoes. But what are your uh, fond memories of the uh, Terry and Dory Funk as a tag team? Well, they, the Funks were an awesome tag team because uh, we all know Dory Funk Sr. was uh, an absolute master of professional wrestling. Uh, uh, played both sides of the card in terms of heel and face, but was uh, a technician like no other. And uh, he taught his boys well. And uh, and uh, I would say Dory Jr. was was a little bit more like the old man, uh, was a technician and uh, knew all the psychology and knew all the uh, technical wrestling. Terry did as well when he was younger too, was a uh, uh, an excellent uh, technical wrestler and, and was NWA champ back in the day for a short time as well as as a more clean-faced, baby face kind of wrestler than he became. But the Funks, if you also think about it, are known for extreme brawling as well. And, uh, and uh, they brawled with uh, many, many different kinds of tag teams, including the Briscoe brothers. That would be more of a scientific match they would have with them. But Terry and Dory were... Uh, absolute holy terrors in Japan too, uh, fighting, uh, 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 giant Baba and some of his, uh, henchmen and, uh, and, uh, yeah, like we saw Terry's, uh, career, he, he went more the kind of, uh, hardcore or brawling sort of route eventually, but, uh, the, the Funks and the Briscoes will never be forgotten for tag teams, uh, just for the teamwork and the skill and the psychology and, uh, and just, playing up success all the way through their careers. And I think the, uh, it would be wrong of us not to bring up the next tag team that I've got written down here, uh, especially considering this is tag team wrestling and probably one of the most notable tag teams throughout the history of all tag team wrestling and the fabulous Freebirds. Yeah, yeah, Freebirds, uh, everything they touched uh, turned to gold for a while there in uh, down in Georgia and uh, <clears throat> Bad Street, USA was Atlanta, Georgia, and that's where they were from. They also kind of pioneered that idea of having a three-man tag team with uh, Roberts, Gordy, and Hayes, where he, uh, their opponents would never really be sure until match time which two you might get, and uh, that that was always a that was always a difficult thing for their opponents too, but. Uh, yeah, the Freebirds were just uh, <clears throat> rock star type characters and uh, arrogant heels, and uh, they they built a lot of heat. Uh, their feud with the Von Erichs in, down in Texas was just tremendously memorable. You know, you couldn't get you couldn't get a better dichotomy between two teams of the kind of Jack Daniels drinking uh, Southern rock and Freebirds, and then the the straight and narrow Von Erich boys drinking their milk and uh, wrestling in bare feet and, and being uh, uh, popular, handsome kind of baby face guys uh, and really just the toast of Texas down there. And they were just printing money uh, uh, in the big Texas stadium there. having the And then there was three Von Erich boys that could do a match against all three Freebirds too. So it was just absolutely perfect and... Uh, those guys will never be forgotten either. Uh, it was so sad when Terry Gordy passed away, but uh, we still got Michael Hayes kicking around, and uh, and yeah, the the Freebirds, huge team, huge huge team. And you talk about uh, the opponents not knowing necessarily which two they were gonna 
uh, wrestle any given night when they're going against the Freebirds. Inevitably, this became known as a rule in wrestling called the Freebird Rule and has actually been uh, used more modernly with the uh, team of the New Day, which I'll uh, kind of go over in a little bit here. But yes, the Free Freebird rule for anybody listening unfamiliar was because the fabulous Freebirds had a team of three and you weren't sure which two you were going to get. It was allowed that any two combination from the group of three was allowed to wrestle. And therefore, moving forward in modern day, if you have the same situation, a group of three guys, tag team championships are among them. They can defend the titles. Doesn't matter which two guys it is, as long as two guys from that group known as the Freebird rule. And you could propagate some uh, deception, too, and pretend one guy was injured and substitute another one in. And there were all kinds of shenanigans that went on with the free bird rule. But yeah, it, isn't it neat that they have a, a rule in wrestling that's still used, named after them? Sure is. Uh, another team I wanted to mention here, uh, the Wild Samoans. I mean, this uh, very rich uh, family heritage when it comes to these guys and uh, well-known inside the ring is the tag team combination. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, we all know that the the Samoans have done so great in wrestling. I don't mean to say just Samoans, but the the Pacific Islanders uh, in general, including Snuka and uh, Tonga Kid and Haku and and Umaga and all the other guys that were from that, not just from uh, uh, the Anoa'i family, but but yeah, Afa and Sika, the Wild Samoans, were the first to start it, uh, managed by Captain Lou Albano up in. Uh, in New York there for WWE and they were multi-time tag teams and they were among the first big tag teams of the seventies that to have a name, to be one, uh, one of those tag teams, that's like <clears throat> a matching pair and they have a name and they look alike. You know what I mean here, Munson? The, the, I think the first big team to do that was back in the fifties was from, <clears throat> from Australia, the fabulous kangaroos are the, the Heffernan brothers and they had the same outfit. The, they had a name which included the two of them. And I've always kind of liked that in tag teams. I, 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 I have a fondness for teams that have that look that's the same together, such as uh, the, the Rock and Roll Express or the Midnight Express. They wear the same uh, outfit and have a name where they're a collective. But I, I also, just on this topic for a second, have a fondness for mis mismatch teams as well. Uh, guys that don't look like they fit together, such as Andre and DiBiase or uh, Owen Hart and Yokozuna, where one guy is strong in one area and the other guy makes up the slack in the other area is, is strong where the other guy is weak. I like both of those kinds of teams, but the Samoans, yeah, had a look that was similar had that high flying Tonga style. Um, were eating the raw fish and 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 all that stuff in their promos and uh, grunting and screaming. The fantastic team that a lot of fans uh, were not only hated but were afraid of too. And you brought up Yokozuna. I could, I would uh, hate not to mention the fact that uh, despite the way that he was uh, <clears throat> billed back in the day, Yokozuna also a Samoan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we move into say early nineties leading into some late 90s and more modern-day tag teams, uh, Pops Moses, is there anybody that we missed here that we should probably talk about? Well, yeah, there's one uh, uh, retro tag team that I'd like to bring up just for uh, special excellences. Uh, and I think a lot of teams learned a lot from them. The teams like we were talking about, like the Midnight Express, uh, heel teams that, that used the most of uh, tag team psychology and rules to uh, get a good match going, and that is... Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens uh, both had been successful uh, single stars before that. But when they came together in the AWA under uh, and then got Bobby Heenan as their manager, but back then he was known as Bobby the Brilliant One Heenan. Uh, this, I can't recommend enough watching their old stuff too. These guys had it down to a science the, the sheer rule breaking they were doing and doing it behind the ref's back doing it perfectly, frustrating the fans, frustrating their opponents. Fantastic stuff. The WWE put out a DVD some years ago of, of uh, AWA and some of its great matches. There, there's a Bockwinkle and Stevens match on there, the very one where they introduce Heenan as their manager. It's against Greg Gagne and Jim Brunzel. This match is a 
is a textbook for a, a heel tag team on, on how to just build heat, how to uh, uh, just be an absolute uh, cheap, cheating, rule-breaking team. Sheer genius, in my opinion, uh, and any uh, discussion of tag teams in the past of pro wrestling would be uh, empty without mentioning uh, Bockwinkle and Stevens, in my opinion. And you know what? I just, as we were talking about this too, something else came to mind, and I know we've not mentioned them recently on the show, but we did watch, uh, do a watch along during Ring Respect Retro back in the day uh, when you introduced me to the Sheep Herders, Papa Smokes, yeah. and I can't go without mentioning how much I enjoyed watching yeah. what the Sheep Herders were. For the modern fans, uh, the Bushwhackers are what you might know them as. That's what I knew about knew of them growing up, and I wouldn't ever classify the Bushwhackers <clears throat> as a team to mention when you're talking about the greats of all time. Yeah. But then when you look back on the Sheep Herders' work, now you start to have them in the conversation. Yeah, yeah, and just like so many uh, WWE wrestlers in the '80s, it was uh, where you could go if you were an established star elsewhere in the in the country. Uh, and Vince decided to pick you up. You could go there and wrestle your last couple of years of your career, probably with some kind of a gimmick attached to you, but you'd be making the big money finally. We saw so many wrestlers do that, including Ric Flair and Harley Race and Junkyard Dog and a whole bunch of guys like that. Uh, it, it was sad for me to think that people know them from that last dying days of their of their careers there and that that's what they're remembered for. But really these guys went because you, you could go out on a, you could finish your career on a big splash instead of a small one, right? On the big stage on TV, getting paid the big money and such. And that's clearly what happened to the sheep herders. But uh, as we watched some of their matches uh, in the past months, and you've seen that they're just fearsome villains, <clears throat> complete rule breakers, complete assholes uh, to everybody uh, uh, involved in their uh, segments. And uh, uh, someone that I watched uh, as a little kid, what was afraid of and, and everything as a little kid. And uh, I'll always love the sheep herders a lot. The Bushwhackers, you know, became a mid card or lower end card tag team uh, in the WWE, a, a comedy spot and a, a little spot for the kids to have a laugh and such like that. And, and that that's fine. In, they made some money at the end of their careers, and, and people remember who they are too, which is which is always a good thing. But always a bit sad for me at times like that to see the past glories kind of gone. And I did get to meet the Bushwhackers as a kid. Great experience. I mean, great guys. They were a lot of fun. <coughs> I mean, I was again. I'm talking like you know, I'm five, six years old at this time. So I mean, not only meeting yeah. the Bushwhackers at the time, but watching them on TV. It was fun for me as a kid because I was a kid. That was the type of entertainment I was exposed to. Well, be glad they were the Bushwhackers when you met them when you were six, <laughs> not the sheep herders, because that experience might have gone a lot differently. Definitely. So so we're going to move forward. Um, I wanted to actually one other team that uh, maybe doesn't land quite in the modern times, but I'm going to bring them up a little bit before as we try to <clears throat> ease into some more modern teams. Uh, the British Bulldogs, always a classic. They're all, all obviously the other end of the spectrum to the sheep herders. These were the clean cut baby faces, uh, really putting on a really technical match inside that ring, especially the stuff the Dynamite Cave brought to the ta table a lot of the time. A uh, great tag team of the past. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, I think that was a case of, of one of those things too, where uh, both Dynamite and Davy Boy, uh, started their training in England, which is a little bit different style than we do over here. It's a little stiffer. It's a little, uh, little closer to real, uh, grappling, I think, but, uh, both, uh, Dynamite Kid and, and Davey Boy Smith, once they came to North America, came to Calgary where they could really get their training, uh, amped up <clears throat> in Stu Hart's dungeon and, uh, with all the Hart boys and such. And, Really, Stampede had such a great, great thing going for a long time there, and and they had uh, they not only put on great shows, but all the guys they trained out there were were solid, solid professional wrestlers. And uh, you know, uh, Dynamite and Davey had already started; were were already kind of journeyman wrestlers at that point. But when they came together in in Stampede, they just uh, they were. They added on to that great training they had already had with more and more great training. And then that's that's why they turned out to be such a strong tag team, uh, in my opinion. And 
you know, it's kind of funny. You called them the clean cut uh, baby face team and all that too, but uh, it's fun. That's how they wrestled in the ring. But uh, to know some of the behind the scenes stuff, they were not popular because Dynamite was a pretty mean guy and a real mean ribber. And I won't go into detail about some of the uh, ribs he pulled on other wrestlers in the back, but some of that was pretty mean shit, man, and uh, and would probably start a fight, except that uh, Dynamite was a pretty tough guy, too, and was not scared of anyone. But uh, uh, also on Dynamite's suggestion, uh, watch some of those uh, matches from the 80s, too. When, when they're in there with preliminary talent, uh, they pretty stiff, man. They treat the guys real rough, and uh, lots of those... Uh, uh, I like to call them preliminary talents, uh, didn't want uh, that, that assignment. Same thing with Road Warriors in the old days. Uh, they always said some of the guys would come in and see their name on the on the list in the back against Road Warriors and just pick up their bag and walk right out because you're in for a rough night. Same thing with uh, British Bulldogs. They, uh, they, they, they were not uh, gentle in there. And you mentioned them training with the Hart family, which uh, brings me to another team we're going to mention, and that is the Hart Foundation. And we could go on to <clears throat> different variations of the Hart Foundation later yeah. on. You had Owen and Davy Boy. Uh, at times you had, you know, Owen and Brett teaming up. But I'm talking about the original Hart Foundation. We're talking about Jim the Apple Knight, Art, Brett the Hitman Hart, the ones that really kind of conquered the WWF in the late 80s uh, into the early 90s there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an unforgettable team as well. That was one of the teams also that I thought, uh, along with the British Bulldogs, it was kind of interesting. Even once they got to WWF, they were still allowed to, uh, They I, presumably they pitched it to uh, Vince, where, you know, in the case of the Hart Foundation, Brett might have said, well, I got this guy that I worked with in, in Calgary. He's my brother-in-law. We know each other inside and out. We should be a tag team. Probably the same thing with Davy Boy and uh, Dynamite Kid, and uh, were allowed to to uh, uh, make their own team like that. Or I presume they did anyway. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, Vince knew that those Calgary guys knew what they were talking about, and uh, it's kind of like the same thing with uh, Hart, Bret Hart's uh, defense of the uh, Intercontinental Champion Championship at SummerSlam at Wembley when. Uh, Mr. Mr. Perfect was unable to uh, make his date for that, and they, it was it was uh, the day before the match or the day of the match, and they, they didn't have an opponent for him, and Brett just said, well, why don't you make it Davey? Uh, we've, I've worked with him a million times. Like, we could throw together a good match. And he, well, yeah, but Davey's a baby face as well, and, well, it's Wembley, uh, London, England is his hometown. Like, you know, I'll heal it up a little bit, and... Uh, and Davy Boy will be the hometown hero. So uh, again, the the Vince trusted those Calgary guys uh, to a certain extent that they had worked so much together in the past and were so well trained that they could they could always put on a good show. And I think that was true of Hart Foundation and uh, British Bulldogs. Very much so. And I mean, a lot of that can be, a, you know, not only just the Calgary guys, but I mean, Brett, just a true legend of the ring. I mean, I've said it before how much of a fan I am of Brett the Hitman Hart's yeah. work throughout the years and that's never going to change for me so but uh, we're going to talk about a few more uh, more modern teams that came along I, I remember you know some of my early memories of tag team wrestling being with uh, guys from the Steiner brothers I remember yeah. uh, Scott and Rick Steiner coming in uh, having that real clean cut this is the you know the the NCAA like professional wrestling guys that had just been fresh out of the universities even though I know now that wasn't quite the case I know that uh, Rick Steiner himself actually started off a little bit before yeah. Scotty even got into it and stuff like that. But I do remember the team of the Steiner brothers and, you know, some very memorable moves and matches that those guys would be able to put on inside the ring and got me a little bit more excited about tag team wrestling in the aspect of WWF wrestling back in the early 90s. Yeah, no question the Steiners will be remembered as one of the greater teams in professional wrestling history. Uh, they had that... Uh that collegiate background that, that really does make a, a pro wrestler seem more believable when he's got a good sports background behind him. They were both uh, uh, brothers that were all American at uh, University of Michigan and uh, they were Wolverines on the wrestling team there. And uh, yeah, they, they, they were another team that came out pretty stiff too. They, they were not out there to uh, hurt anybody or anything like that, but uh, 
they were such huge, strong guys that you there wasn't much you could do about it. If they were going to suplex you across the ring onto your head, that's what you were going to do then. And uh, and uh, they they won everything there is to win. And uh, again, that that's another team that really never took off in WWE. I'm not sure if it was because of the booking or something like that, but uh, uh, I, I think they could have been popular anywhere if they were used properly, for sure. Definitely. So, and then uh, I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit. I know I've talked to you a bit about it before. I didn't necessarily watch WCW quite off the pop of uh, my pro wrestling watching. And I learned about them kind of as a lot of guys from WWF were jumping ship. And I remember when I turned over to there and you'd look at a lot of it and a lot of it was just rehashed WWF guys and stuff like that. But there was always some people that stood out. And for me, the one tag team that really stood out over in WCW that I'm always going to remember from that era that I enjoyed watching and I would actually tune into any of the matches they had back then, it Harlem Heat. I, oh. I really enjoyed Harlem Heat back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. I I, I also did. I didn't know who uh, Stevie Ray was so much. I knew who Booker T was because he had done some stuff before that. But what a great team too. And And there's another one where the they decided to have a look where they matched up. They wore the same trunks. They looked real cool. They were both huge. They had the nice flames and everything on their outfit. And then with a, an excellent manager like Sherry Martell, uh, they, they really struck gold with that tag team in WCW. Uh, those guys probably like weren't even all that experienced of a team, but they got a good push. And the boys uh, made the best of it. And, uh, and yeah, when you talk about 90s WCW, <clears throat> Harlem Heat was, <clears throat> excuse me, Harlem Heat was the team to beat at that time. And uh, numerous runs as champion, a bunch of good feuds, good manager. And, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll be remembered for a long time. Definitely. So, so definitely one of the standouts there. Uh, we're going to jump over to kind of like as we hit towards the late 90s here, Papa Smokes. Um, you know, this is about when I was uh, in my teenage years and hitting into my early adulthood now. We're talking about Attitude Era Wrestling. And I'm going to particularly talk about three teams and stuff. And we talked about this before we went on the air here. And I'm going to mention them. Uh, individually, these teams all had, in my opinion, gr some great matches. Uh, some other ones where it's like it became too much of the hardcore stuff over and over again. But let's eliminate all the talk of the hardcore stuff and our thoughts on that. The Hardy Boys... Edge and Christian and Dudley Boys, I feel, were three teams that definitely defined tag team wrestling towards the later 90s, early 2000s in professional wrestling. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I would say even especially the Dudleys were uh, so, so successful. Um, they had a they had a great presentation. The, 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 they were, uh, they kind of had the Hanson Brothers hockey kind of thing going on and the, the fans loved them. Uh, I think uh, Bully and or, uh, Baba and Devon are just uh, all great characters. Uh, uh, Baba or Bully Ray, kind of the leader of the team a little bit, a little bit more uh, outspoken. But Devon, also great, great stuff. Uh, they won every title there was to be won. Uh, I always liked the way they uh, they put uh, celebrities or legends through tables and, and all that. And uh, yeah, yeah, they'll be remembered as one of the great ones. And then this this was just another era of tag team wrestling, you know, after the uh, after some of the other great teams we talked about, like Harlem Heat and Rock and Roll Express, after they were done in the in the 90s and such, we had to get some new ones in. And, and uh, yeah, there we had uh, Edge and Christian, a couple of good Canadian boys that uh, – Came came up to WWE and got signed by uh, uh, Jim Jim Ross and Cornette and same thing with the uh, Hardy Boys too. Uh, were they didn't have a developmental program uh, per se back then, so they relied on uh, WWE relied on some of their uh, the knowledge of their uh, uh, wrestling uh, employees there and the people that had watched tapes. You know, back then uh, even before the internet was a huge thing where you could watch everything they needed guys like jim ross uh Cornette and and uh uh pritchard and and pat patterson who had who had watched tons of this stuff and knew how to scout talent like that too and uh yeah and some of those guys they brought in uh 
the Hardy Boys gave them a deal. You know, they 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 weren't going to get signed at first because they weren't big enough. And you know how Vince likes his big guys, but uh, you know it ended up happening. And 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 look what happened. Look what they did with their chance, right? Like they're one of the teams that will also never be forgotten in the history of wrestling. And same with Edge and Christian too. Both had uh, extremely uh, uh, good uh, singles runs after that too. But um, as a tag team, you know those those uh, ladder matches and the TLC matches and stuff with some of the teams we're, we've just been talking about are our WWE classics. And uh, you know that wrestlers today that were young when that stuff was coming out look to that and to. Uh, you know, develop their style and some of their tricks. And uh, yeah, they'll be watched for for 50 years after this. So let's uh, let's mention it. Uh, we're talking about more modern teams. I'm going to talk about a, a couple of modern day WWE teams. And then we're going to go on to talk about a couple from MLW and finish up with a little bit of a discussion at FTR. So I know uh, a lot of people are really high on the team of the New Day. And uh, I know you're familiar with uh, the... The guy's a bit there too, Papa Spokes, but uh, watching more modern wrestling, uh, the New Day is one of these ones that uh, the the fabulous Freebird rule was brought back for with these three guys, Xavier Woods, Kofi Kingston, Big E, Big e Langston, and everything like that. This team has actually been around for quite a, quite a while now at this point with, uh, I believe now officially as of the other night now, seven tag team title runs, one of which actually is now officially the longest tag team title run in WWE history, having just edged out Demolition, I believe, for that uh, for that uh, run as the tag team champions. It's really hard to document it now with there being two different tag titles, two different shows within yeah. WWE. But as far as I'm concerned, it's a WWE championship in that tag team vein, so therefore it classifies under the same. Uh, they had a lot of great feuds, and to me, a lot of those great feuds really all came back down to the Usos and the Usos to me, probably one of the best modern day tag teams. I like the work of these guys, especially once they made their heel turn. I think that, uh, you know, obviously it's in their blood being from the uh, Samoan family that they're from and everything like that. But the work of uh, the Usos inside that ring, especially when they got in there with the new day and got a little bit innovative as well too. When they got in there and started doing the hell in a cell match that they had between the Usos and the new day, there was some innovations there. I believe where the Usos actually pinned Kofi King or not sorry not Kofi Kingston but Xavier Woods pinned him to the side of the cell using the kendo sticks or whatever. So utilizing some of this stuff that we joke about like why do they have kendo sticks there in the first place? But if you're gonna have them there, utilize them in a way that makes it interesting. They did that night and it was quite entertaining. Uh, I still look upon that as you know a fond time for modern wrestling in terms of the tag division. None thought. You know, maybe there was an opportunity that we're going to see a real revival and a breath of fresh air in tag team wrestling. Unfortunately, just like all modern wrestling, as soon as something starts to get good, they shit all over it and uh, put it back down. Now they've uh, gone ahead. They've split the New Day. The tag titles are with Kofi and Xavier, but Big E staying on another show. Just a big pile of garbage mess like it usually is. It's kind of unfortunate because being a fan of tag wrestling, I would have loved to have seen maybe more of that. I know some people get tired of seeing, okay, you know, New Day and Usos over and over again. But, I mean, there's something to be said there with those uh, those boys. They work well together in the ring. There's a reason that they stood out well together. And that's, uh, that's what I'm going to bring there. Seven runs is nothing to nothing to be ashamed of for the New Day. I mean, great for them. It was a great place on the card and really helped, in my opinion, elevate those guys. I mean, we know Kofi was around for a while, had, you know, a decent name behind him as a uh, mid-card to upper, mid- upper mid-card talent. Uh, Xavier Woods and Big E almost had nothing going for them at the time. Nobody knew them. Nobody really had any reason to get behind them. And these guys, they were put together. They became friends, told to come up with something. They came up with, yeah, it's it, it's goofy at times. Don't get me wrong. A lot of the gimmick is very silly. But at the heart of it, I can see three guys having a good time, that are good friends, and they went out there. And when it came down to the actual ring work, they got the job done. They utilized the three-person rule quite well at times, often utilizing that thing where, you know, when they were heels, they would pretend like one guy was injured and utilize that just like the Freebirds used to back in the day. I mean, so kudos in terms of the modern day, the New Day Usos, two standouts, in my opinion, from WWE. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. I I honestly haven't watched much of the New Day's stuff. I, some of the some of the comedy gimmickry was kind of a bit too much for me. It seemed like all uh, trombones and pancakes for a while there. But uh, the Usos, I, I was going to bring up a point about them. We've we talked in the past about uh, the Guerrero brothers, uh, another good tag team we could yes. bring out. Not okay. brothers, I guess. They were nephew and uncle. But um, just like someone from those wrestling families, I, I've read that Eddie taught Eddie and, and uh, Chavo Jr. talked about uh, uh, having a, a wrestling ring in their yard ever since they can ever remember. And I, I'm going to imagine that it was the same thing for the young Uso brothers coming from that uh, Samoan heritage and so many other uh, family members being in the wrestling biz, that I'm going to go uh, out on a limb and guess that they were kids that grew up with a ring that they could use at any time and with a whole bunch of relatives that they could ask questions to at any time too. And I mean, when you're that young of a kid and you have that much access to uh, a ring and uh and other experienced and and famous wrestlers that you can talk to get trained by get advice from get ideas from i mean it's almost a, it's almost a foregone conclusion that you're going to end up as a big popular wrestler at some point and like yeah watch the usos match they look like they're uh, uh so so comfortable in the ring and and uh They've got all the tag team psychology down, and I've been impressed by a few of their matches as well. So there are teams that are uh, continuing the the, the uh, excellent days of the Crockett, uh, Jim Crockett Promotions tag team in the 80s and that. And uh, even though WWE isn't, isn't valuing tag team wrestling all that much these days, putting it on the preliminary and mid-card areas, ne never any tag team main events, you still have uh, uh, good uh, uh, lifelong wrestlers like the Uso brothers that came up in the biz and uh, could had all the tools to make it big in WWE. Definitely so. So uh, enough about WWE though. Let's uh, let's talk about a few things outside the WWE and outside the big guys for a little bit. Well, I mean, we'll end on one of the big guys here, but uh, let's talk a little bit about one of our favorites. We're talking about MLW, and let's. Uh, Maybe bring up the uh, some of the teams over there, in particular the Von Erichs, the t MLW Tag Champs, as we head towards the hashtag re the restart of MLW coming up here. Yeah, well, speaking of uh, young guys that would have grown up in the wrestling family and in the business, uh, Ross and Marshall Von Erich being the sons of Kevin Von Erich, I mean, uh, the fact that they're young and wrestlers now kind of uh, suggests that they probably wanted to be that their whole lives and with the famous wrestler dad from the that famous famous family in texas von eric said they, they would have just been uh, earmarked for greatness uh, probably from an early age and uh, they're still kind of learning like they they still have their moments where they look a little bit green even on uh, mlw but they're working on it the, the boy they're big they're handsome. They look great, and I, I they're going to be a, a successful uh, tag team in the world of professional wrestling, probably as long as they want to, especially having that last name. And you know, a lot of great things going on over there at MLW. So a great opportunity for them to flourish with some other great teams there, and a lot of great teams that have been built. We were talking before the show went on the air about. Uh, also, the uh, the dynasty over there as well too that uh, happened in MLW. We're talking about uh, uh, Pillman Jr. and Davy Boy Smith Jr., who also made a great team, and also have that lineage of uh, you know parents that were involved working together. Because we know that the uh, late Brian Pillman and the late Davy Boy Smith, also part of the Hart Foundation, that uh, took part in around the Attitude Era of the late 1990s there for the WWF. So another great uh, pairing that's uh, working on becoming uh, you know future stars in the business. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, they've got that name to go back on too. And then there's uh, another tag team in MLW that I'm uh, really enjoying these days, and that's uh, Alexander Hammerstone and Richard Holiday. And uh, uh, as a as a heel tag team, they're just ripping it up over there. Uh, they've got their uh, faction kind of thing. They had a couple of other members, one of which was M MJF, who is obviously uh, busy right now in AEW. 
they had another guy too that didn't really work out so right now their faction is just the two of them and uh uh hammerstone holds that open weight championship but uh him and richard holiday doing lots of uh tag team action together and uh like we've said before, uh, MLW really one of the best promotions going at this time. I think they have integrity with their uh, business model and with their booking. And uh, and uh, Court Bauer has just uh, gone out of his way to get different kinds of wrestlers from different parts of the world that, that re wrestle different styles, including Lucha. And uh, he's trying to open up throughout Europe and uh, even some parts of Africa and all that. And yeah, he just brings a flavor to the show that is uh, that is just excellent, and they've got all kinds of lucha tag teams going on there too, with uh, L.A. Park and uh, El Hijo de Park, his son, I guess, and uh, all kinds of lucha action going on, and a strong tag team division. I, I can't wait to see more of it in the future. Looking forward to it, and uh, you can check that up. That's uh, we're <clears> probably about a month away, or just over a month away from uh, MLW's uh, hashtag, the restart. So look forward to that. Uh, go check them out once they do get up and running and check out some of the old material from them as well, too. You won't be disappointed. Uh, we're going to end the show on a tag team here today, Pop of Smokes, because there is a bit to talk about these guys, uh, both in the sense that uh, you and I both have enjoyed work of theirs and also have seen a decline, not necessarily that is of their fault, but we mentioned about MJF and AEW. So let's... Uh, Let's get on the top of AEW and FTR, the Revival, Cash and Dax, whatever uh, name we want to go by. Uh, what a great team these guys are and have the potential to be when given the right teams to work with. When they came up through NXT, they made a mark instantly. Uh, some great classics there that they had with uh, Jordan and Gable at the time, known as American Alpha. I mean, some absolute just barn burner matches that they had with the two of those guys. And then... Some of the ones that they had with DIY as well, too. And many regard the match in Toronto with DIY and uh, FTR as being one of the better tag team matches, especially in modern wrestling. But if not, you know, in question for one of the better tag team matches of all time. Couldn't couldn't agree more. It's a it, it's an absolute classic. Great match. And Dax and Cash really know how to put on a show. The part that really grinds me a lot too is they were so upset with the way they were being treated in wwe and i get that but then they leave to go to aew and this had to have in my opinion been one of the biggest mistakes they could make in terms of being a tag team because the tag team division in aew in my opinion is not up to par with what tag team wrestling should be it's no better a situation than what's going on in the wwe and they have been left with in my opinion inferior opponents Nobody really to book them strongly against and nobody that can give them the type of classic match that they got out of guys like DIY and American Alpha over in the WWE. Yeah, I got to agree with you there, Munson. and I, I was I was happy for them and, and uh, that they after all the contract struggles in the WWE that they finally did get their release and that they would be free to do what they wanted and work with who they wanted and then. I was a little bit surprised that they signed with AEW because it didn't seem like a, that natural of a fit because as we've talked about FTR, uh, just as our whole topic is today, FTR is our students of of classic 80s uh, prime time uh, uh, golden era tag team wrestling of, of like we said, Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express, Arn and Tully. <clears throat> the Four Horsemen, all those uh, classic tag teams of the 80s, you see that influence in FTR style. But what they've done in joining AEW is is joining a, a company where nobody else works like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, a AEW has, what, 20, 25 tag teams, and, and none of them uh, work like a classic team. They all uh, are very gimmick heavy. They all uh, w work the very, very modern style, and and that's that's unlike Dax and Cash. The way they uh, they uh, revere the the great historians and the the great performers of the past. Yet, yeah, like you say, they have no one really to work with in this company that uh, has a similar style to them. And I watched their their debut in in AEW in the the first few matches they had there, and and. I was kind of disappointed because 
their their booking in AEW is so confusing all the time. They they're trying to go the route of not having a, a clearly defined heels and faces, but it takes away a lot of the heat from the match when you don't have that. Uh, uh, you can argue that the modern wrestling fan is beyond the the uh, archetype of having one one villain and and one face team against each other, and and, and modern fans like to say, well, they, we don't need that anymore, and it's it's too simple, and it's not needed anymore. But I kind of have to uh, disagree with that because uh, the only way that you really get the heat in in professional wrestling is is one tag team is acting like complete assholes and cheating the whole time therefore the fans are going to cheer for the team that's keeping it straight and when you have all these uh you know since since stone cold steve austin the the ultimate heel that you loved to hate and, and became so popular there's many many wrestlers now that, that want to ride that razor's edge between being hated and being loved and and you can't do that like the only the only once a generation will somebody come along that that can do that that is so over and so good at his craft that he can uh, walk the line between heel and face and and i just i i don't think that that most of these wrestlers nowadays can do that or should try to do that so right off the bat i i was disappointed by ftr's booking uh they they stomped their way to the championships pretty quickly which i think was a good idea for AEW to do but since then, it's looked like they've struggled without quality opposition. And I mean, even the team they won the belts from, uh, Omega and Page, was kind of a pasted together team that uh, they're also quite uh, different in the way they wrestle, Omega and Page, and really not a memorable tag team. They just, they needed champs right off the bat. And since Omega was doing the booking of the uh, tag team division, of course, he's going to, put himself in there with some gold on and uh i just think it's been uh, kind of a shit show to be perfectly honest and uh, I, I love that ftr is is bringing their real brand of wrestling there but they look like they're struggling without proper opposition and we'll just have to see what happens in the future i guess hopefully things pick up for them over there or better yet you know if they would have done what i was hoping for in the first place i would have loved to have seen ftr go perfect their craft around the world, go over to places like Japan, go over to the UK and uh, hop on with some of the companies out there, you know, even come spend some time here in good old Canada and stuff like that. I think we really could have seen a lot of utilization for FTR throughout the independence uh, over in New Japan and some of the bigger places in the UK. And then also maybe being able to do some spots with the NWA and MLW, I mean, a lot of great teams that you would have there. I mean, God forbid, the NWA would have been an absolute perfect fit for the style of FTR. Yeah, yeah. But I think just in uh, today's modern era of wrestling, or really any era of wrestling, you, you only get that window where you're a big superstar on a limited basis. It's not going to last forever. And I can see why they wanted to go to a company that has a national TV show where you can get noticed and, and get your name out there and uh, make some money while, you, while you're still physically able to and all that. I, I'm quite sure that uh, Cash and Dax would love to go and uh, rumble with some of the teams in NWA or N MLW, but I think it's they have to be current. They have to be up there with the uh, money makers in the game and the, the big movers and shakers, and that, that's what they did with the move to AEW. Well, hopefully, uh, maybe things will get better in the in, in the near future. I don't want to sit here and make it seem like we're going to constantly rag on AEW or AEW's booking. Uh, again, we we both are on the same page that I think we would love to see AEW just take what they're doing and take away the goofiness and go for that seriousness they always talked about because. We do need an alternative to what we get from the big guys over the WWE. It would be nice to have something treated more like the old classic sports wrestling show that you used to get in the past. Well, you know, giving it a modern spin. Not every match has to be booked 50-50. Not every guy has to be pushed to the, you know, to the friggin' moon and stuff like that. You got guys that are there. They're preliminary guys. That's the way they should be. FTR should be treated like gold, but given, you know, some good opponents to work there with and give them people a reason to hate these guys the way that they should. I mean, these guys were 
classic in WWE for some of those spots where it's like, you know, they just would do those classic dirty heel tricks behind the referee's back that, you know, it would really grind your gears. You're like, man, fuck these guys. But at the same time, you're rooting for them because this works. And it proved that it worked over and over again. You know what? FTR, great tag team. Hope nothing but for the best for them. And hopefully, hey, let's, you know, maybe in a year's time, we'll be sitting here talking about the excitement of an AEW show for the first time ever. You know, hopefully change our minds, AEW. Please do, because we need an alternative to what we're watching on TV on a regular basis these days. That said, though, Papa Smokes, I mean, this is one of our longest running episodes of Ring Respect Radio we've had in a long time. And I think we could probably go on talking all night about tag team wrestling and the history of it. This has been probably one of my most favorite episodes of this show that we have done so far. Continues to only get better, and hopefully you, the fans, enjoyed it as well. Uh, If you did enjoy the show, let us know in the comments below. Make sure to like and subscribe right here on Ring Respect Radio. And as said before, check us out on all of Backbreaker Media's cast as well including podbean and youtube there uh from papa smokes and i both we want to thank you again for spending time listening to us here today and hopefully we'll be hearing from you in the near future have a good night